Top 25 IT Support Specialist Interview Questions and Answers In this video, we will explore the top 25 interview questions commonly asked to IT support specialists. Each question plays a crucial role in assessing both technical skills and problem-solving abilities in potential candidates. We will also provide detailed answers and insights to help you prepare effectively. Whether you're a job seeker or an interviewer, these examples will enhance your understanding of what to expect during the hiring process. 1. What operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, are you most comfortable supporting? I am most comfortable supporting Windows and Linux operating systems. Windows is prevalent in business environments, and I have extensive experience troubleshooting issues such as software installations, network connectivity, and system performance. On the other hand, my background in Linux includes managing servers, scripting for automation, and performing system updates. This combination allows me to address a wide range of technical issues across different platforms, ensuring users receive effective support tailored to their operating system of choice. 2. How would you troubleshoot a user who cannot connect to the internet? To troubleshoot a user who cannot connect to the internet, first, check if the issue is with the device or the network. Confirm that the device is connected to the correct Wi-Fi network or, if using a wired connection, ensure the Ethernet cable is securely plugged in. Next, verify if the internet connection is active by checking other devices. If those are operational, restart the user's device and the modem, router. Run a network diagnostic tool to identify issues. If necessary, release and renew the IP address or check the DNS settings. If problems persist, escalate the issue to the network administrator for further analysis. 3. Explain the steps to reset a user's password in Active Directory. Resetting a user's password in Active Directory involves several key steps. First, open the Active Directory users and computers console. Locate the user account for which you need to reset the password. Right-click on the user account and select Reset Password. In the dialog box that appears, enter the new password, ensuring it meets the organization's password policy. Optionally, check the box to require the user to change their password at the next logon. Finally, click OK to apply the changes and notify the user of their new password securely. 4. What is DHCP and how does it work? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. It is a network management protocol used on IP networks. DHCP automatically assigns IP addresses and other network configuration parameters to devices on a network, allowing them to communicate efficiently. When a device connects to a network, it sends a DHCP discover message. The DHCP server responds with an offer containing an IP address and configuration details. The device then sends a request to accept the offer, and the server acknowledges the request. This process simplifies network management by reducing the need for manual IP address assignment. 5. How would you diagnose and resolve a slow-performing computer? To diagnose a slow-performing computer, begin by checking system resource usage through Task Manager to identify any programs consuming excessive CPU, memory, or disk usage. Next, run a full malware scan to eliminate any infections that could be impacting performance. Ensure that the operating system and applications are updated, as outdated software can lead to slowdowns. Additionally, check for hardware issues such as failing hard drives or insufficient RAM. If necessary, Consider optimizing startup programs and performing disk cleanup to free up space and improve speed. 6. What is the difference between TCP and UDP? TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, is a connection-oriented protocol that ensures reliable data transmission through error checking, acknowledgements, and the establishment of a connection before data transfer. It guarantees that packets arrive in order and without duplication. On the other hand, UDP, User Datagram Protocol, is a connectionless protocol that allows for faster data transmission by sending packets without establishing a connection or ensuring delivery. This makes UDP suitable for applications where speed is crucial, such as video streaming or online gaming, but it sacrifices reliability and ordering. 7. How do you remotely assist a user who is having technical issues? To remotely assist a user experiencing technical issues, I would first establish communication through a phone call or chat to understand the problem. Then, I would use remote desktop software such as TeamViewer or Remote Desktop Connection, to access the user's machine securely. I would navigate through their system, explaining each step taken to resolve the issue while ensuring the user feels involved in the process. If necessary, I would guide them on how to perform specific tasks or adjustments themselves for future reference. This approach fosters user confidence and enhances their technical understanding. 8. What are some common causes of a blue screen of death, BSOD, in Windows, and how would you fix it? Common causes of a blue screen of death, BSOD, include hardware failures, driver issues, and software conflicts. Hardware problems might arise from failing RAM, overheating components, or a malfunctioning hard drive. Outdated or corrupt drivers can trigger BSODS, especially graphics and network drivers. To fix these issues, first check hardware components, ensuring they're properly connected and functioning. 
update or reinstall drivers through Device Manager, and run Windows Memory Diagnostic to check RAM health. If necessary, restore system settings using System Restore or Repair Windows through Installation Media. 9. How do you set up and troubleshoot a VPN connection? To set up a VPN connection, first, ensure you have the necessary VPN client software installed. Next, enter the server address, your username, and password provided by your VPN service. Adjust any specific settings required, such as protocols and encryption options. Once configured, connect to the VPN. If issues arise, start by confirming internet connectivity. Check for correct login credentials and server address. Inspect firewall settings that may block the VPN test with different protocols or servers if available. Lastly, consult logs for error messages to guide further troubleshooting steps. 10. What is DNS, and how would you troubleshoot DNS-related issues? DNS, or domain name system, translates domain names into IP addresses, allowing users to access websites using easy-to-remember names. To troubleshoot DNS-related issues, first, verify connectivity to the DNS server by pinging its IP address. If connectivity is fine, check the DNS settings on the user's device to ensure they point to the correct server. Flushing the DNS cache can resolve stale records, while using tools like NS Lookup can help diagnose resolution failures. If problems persist, consider checking for issues with the DNS server itself, such as service outages or misconfigurations. 11. How do you handle a frustrated user who is experiencing repeated technical issues? When dealing with a frustrated user, I prioritize active listening. I allow them to express their concerns without interruption, validating their feelings. After understanding their issue, I reassure them that I will work diligently to find a solution. I then ask clarifying questions to gather more details. Transparency is key. I explain the troubleshooting steps I will take and provide regular updates on progress. If a solution takes time, I ensure they know I'm still working on it. Building rapport helps in calming their frustration, reinforcing that their concerns are taken seriously. 12. Describe a time when you had to explain a technical issue to a non-technical person. How did you ensure they understood? In a previous role, I had to explain network connectivity issues to a non-technical client. I started by avoiding jargon and using simple analogies, comparing the network to a road system where data is like cars traveling to their destination. I used diagrams to visualize the problem, showing how traffic congestion, bandwidth issues, could slow down their connection. I encouraged questions throughout the explanation, ensuring they felt comfortable. By summarizing key points and confirming their understanding, I made sure they grasped the situation and felt reassured about the solution process. 13. How do you prioritize multiple support tickets with different urgency levels? When prioritizing multiple support tickets, I evaluate each ticket based on urgency and impact. I categorize them using a triage system. Critical issues affecting business operations get immediate attention, followed by high-impact problems that hinder productivity. Next, I address routine inquiries or minor issues. Communication is key. I keep users informed about their ticket status and estimated response times. Regularly reviewing and adjusting priorities ensures that urgent matters are handled promptly while maintaining service quality across all tickets. 14. What steps do you take to document IT issues and resolutions? Documentation is crucial in IT support. First, I ensure that I gather all relevant details about the issue reported by the user, including error messages, user actions, and timestamps. Next, I categorize the issue based on its type and severity. I then outline the troubleshooting steps taken, including any diagnostic tools used, tests performed, and the final resolution. It's essential to keep the documentation clear and concise for future reference. I store this information in a centralized knowledge base, allowing team members easy access for similar issues later. Regularly reviewing and updating documentation helps maintain accuracy and relevance. 15. How would you handle a situation where you don't know the solution to a user's problem? When faced with a situation where I don't know the solution, I would first reassure the user that I am committed to helping them. I would ask clarifying questions to gather as much information as possible about the issue. Then, I would conduct research using available resources, such as knowledge bases, forums, or documentation. If necessary, I would escalate the problem to a more experienced colleague or specialist. Keeping the user informed throughout the process is essential, ensuring they feel supported and aware of the steps being taken. 16. What are some best practices for ensuring endpoint security, e.g., antivirus, patches, firewalls? Ensuring endpoint security involves several best practices. First, always keep antivirus software updated and run regular scans to detect threats. Implementing a robust patch management process is critical, ensuring all operating systems and applications receive timely updates to fix vulnerabilities. Firewalls should be configured correctly to monitor and control incoming and outgoing network traffic. Additionally, user training on recognizing phishing attempts and safe browsing habits can greatly reduce risks. Finally, consider using encryption for sensitive data to protect it from unauthorized access.
17. How would you respond if you discovered a potential malware infection on a user's machine? Upon discovering a potential malware infection, I would first isolate the affected machine from the network to prevent further spread. I would then run a full antivirus scan using up-to-date definitions to identify and remove the malware. If the infection is severe, I would restore the system from a clean backup, ensuring no data loss. Communication with the user is essential. I would explain the situation and provide guidance on safe computing practices. Finally, I would review security measures and educate the user on recognizing suspicious activities to prevent future infections. 18. What is multi-factor authentication, MFA, and why is it important? Multi-factor authentication, MFA, is a security measure that requires users to provide two or more verification factors to gain access to a resource, such as an application or online account. This typically includes something the user knows, like a password, something the user has, like a smartphone, and something the user is, like a fingerprint. MFA is important because it significantly reduces the risk of unauthorized access. Even if an attacker obtains a user's password, they would still need additional verification factors, making it much harder for them to compromise sensitive information. 19. How do you ensure data privacy when handling sensitive user information? Ensuring data privacy involves implementing several key practices. First, always encrypt sensitive data both at rest and in transit to protect it from unauthorized access. Limit access to this information strictly to those who need it for their job functions. Regularly train staff on data protection policies and the importance of confidentiality. Additionally, conduct audits and assessments to identify vulnerabilities and ensure compliance with relevant regulations like GDPR or HIPAA. Finally, establish clear data retention policies to manage how long sensitive information is kept and when it should be securely disposed of. 20. What steps would you take if a user reported a phishing email? When a user reports a phishing email, the first step is to reassure them and thank them for reporting it. Next, I would instruct the user not to click any links or download attachments from the email. Then, I would gather details about the email, such as sender information, subject line, and any suspicious links. I would analyze the email headers to trace its origin. Following this, I would educate the user on recognizing phishing attempts and recommend reporting the email to our IT security team. Lastly, I would ensure the email is flagged or blocked in our email system to prevent others from falling victim. 21. Describe a time when you resolved a complex IT issue under pressure. In a high-stake situation, a critical server went down during business hours, impacting multiple departments. I quickly gathered the relevant team members and assessed the situation. After identifying that a recent update caused the failure, I rolled back the update while monitoring the server's performance. Simultaneously, I communicated with affected users, providing them with timely updates. Within an hour, the server was restored, and normal operations resumed. My ability to remain calm and organized under pressure ensured minimal disruption and strengthened my team's trust in my problem-solving skills. 22. Have you ever made a mistake while troubleshooting? How did you handle it? I once misdiagnosed a network connectivity issue, assuming it was a router problem. After replacing the router without resolving the issue, I realized the problem was a faulty network cable. Admitting my mistake, I promptly communicated with the user, explaining the situation and outlining my next steps. I replaced the cable, which fixed the issue. This experience taught me the importance of thorough troubleshooting and checking all possibilities before jumping to conclusions. It reinforced my approach to double-check assumptions and maintain clear communication with users throughout the process. 23. How do you stay updated with the latest IT trends and technologies? Staying updated with the latest IT trends and technologies involves a combination of methods. I regularly read industry publications and blogs, such as TechCrunch and Ars Technica, to keep abreast of emerging developments. Participating in webinars and online courses allows me to deepen my knowledge on specific topics. Networking with peers through professional organizations and attending conferences provides insights into best practices and innovations. I also follow thought leaders on social media platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, which helps me engage with current discussions and trends in the IT landscape. 24. Tell me about a time you improved an IT process or system to enhance efficiency. During my previous role, I noticed that our ticket resolution process was taking longer than necessary due to a lack of standardized procedures. I initiated a project to develop a comprehensive knowledge base, documenting common issues and their solutions. By collaborating with team members, we created step-by-step -step guides and troubleshooting checklists. This resource reduced average resolution time by 30%, allowing us to handle more tickets efficiently. The team became more confident in resolving issues, and user satisfaction improved noticeably as a result. 25. If a critical system went down, what steps would you take to restore it quickly? In the event of a critical system failure, my first step would be to assess the situation by gathering information from monitoring tools and user reports. Next, I would prioritize communication with stakeholders, informing them of the issue and expected downtime. Following that, 
I would initiate troubleshooting processes, such as checking hardware connections, verifying logs, and analyzing potential software conflicts. If the issue persists, I would escalate it to the appropriate technical team while simultaneously working on a contingency plan to restore services through backups or alternative solutions. Regular updates would be provided throughout the process to keep everyone informed. In preparing for an IT support specialist interview, familiarizing yourself with the top questions can significantly boost your confidence and performance. By understanding both the technical and interpersonal aspects of the role, you position yourself as a well-rounded candidate. Remember to practice your responses and showcase your problem-solving skills. We hope this guide helps you navigate your interview successfully. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more valuable content. Your support means a lot to us.